Welcome everyone. We are going to get started. I'm Murph Eman. I'm the executive director at Columbia Legal Services. And we are so happy that you are joining us today for race equity and legal advocacy moving from theory to practice. First, a couple of housekeeping notes. If you need live captioning, closed captioning, please click on the button at the top of your screen. If you need Spanish or would like to have Spanish interpretation, please go to your meeting controls at the bottom right hand corner of your screen and click on interpretation and pick English or Spanish. Again, the closed captioning is available only in English and you can click on for live transcription. I will start with a short introduction and welcome and set the context for today's panelists and then introduce the panelists. I always like to start these panels with a poem. Some of you may have heard of the poem or heard me say it before. When we engage in race equity advocacy, for me, one of the keys has been a willingness to be vulnerable, to share my story. I thought somehow because of my story that I was immune from racism because I had had a difficult, violent childhood because I had been on welfare, because I had been through substance abuse treatment, because I had been well, mental health arrested, because I had been restrained in five point restraints. Somehow I thought that that made me immune and that I did not have to think about these issues. I'm here to say that it does not. And so one of the keys for me to doing this work has been a willingness to be honest a willingness to be honest about my own racism, my own white privilege, and the ways in which my thinking is influenced by white supremacy. For me, that has been an incredibly difficult yet rewarding part of this journey. So I invite all of you to think about your own stories as you hear the panelists, and to thank the panelists for being willing to take the risk to share their journeys and their stories with you because that's where it has all started at the interpersonal level. And as you hear the panelists, we will move from the interpersonal level to the institutional level, to the systemic level, as we talk about racism, accountability and complicity. So the poem is telling by Laura Hershey. What you risk telling your story, you will bore them. Your voice will break, your ink spill, and stain your coat. No one will understand. Their eyes become fences. You will park yourself forever on the outside. Your differentness, once and for all revealed, dangerous. The names you give to yourself will become epithets. Your happiness be called bravery, denial. Your sadness will justify their pity. Your fear will magnify their fears. Everything you say will prove something about their God or their economic system. Your feelings that change day to day, kaleidoscope will freeze in place, brand you forever, justify anything they decide to do with you. Those with power can afford to tell their story or not. Those without power risk everything to tell their story and must. Someone somewhere will hear your story and decide to fight to live and refuse compromise. Someone else will tell her own story, risking everything. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce the panel today, my friends and colleagues. Each panelist will spend a few minutes telling their story and talking about their work at CLS. First up, we have Nick Allen. Nick Allen will talk about the internal journey at CLS, the work we had to do before we could start doing external race advocacy. Nick Allen has been with Columbia Legal Services for over 10 years. Before that, he was a 
assistant and legislative assistant with uh, King County Council Member Larry Gossett for many years. He graduated from Seattle University School of Law and has won several awards for his advocacy. He is one of the leading experts on legal financial obligations. He has led policy advocacy work on LFO reform, on prison reform, and on other issues related to criminal justice. He speaks nationally about abolition and about race equity and his work. He has also led class action lawsuits to improve medical care for people in prison and about how to lead and work in uh, community-driven advocacy. And I will turn it over to Nick. And one more piece, Nick is also a, I think, 2015 uh, alumni of the Shriver Center's Racial Justice Institute. So thanks, Nick. Yeah, thanks, Murph. And thanks, everyone, for joining today. Um, you know, I, like Merv mentioned, I'll give you a little bit of history about the, you know, initial race equity work that was done at CLS um, um, on how to incorporate it both uh, externally as it relates to our advocacy and, and internally as it as it um, uh, as an organization. Um, you know, CLS when I started and up until the last few years really fit, fit the mold of a traditional uh, legal aid organization, and as a result. The focus of the work almost exclusively was on poverty without any intentional consideration of, you know, the, the paramount role race and racism plays in, in our work and in creating and perpetuating poverty and also what poverty looks like in our communities. Um, since, since I've been at CLS, there, there's always been staff who understood this dynamic and often pushed their own advocacy in that direction, tried to push others, but, but uh, that was the exception. And oftentimes their approach to this work was, you know, devalued, criticized, and um, and, and othered. Um, and and so institutionally, uh, the discussion around race and developing advocacy uh, was almost non-existent. Um, in in fact, I, I think there was a significant hesitancy in discussing race. Um, there were no institutional policies, and there didn't appear to be any organizational um, interest in. In, in transforming our work also into uh, racial justice work. That started to change a little in uh, 2016. Our uh, executive director at the time had been part of some discussions with a lot of national partner organizations and, and be having, be, began having discussions internally with some staff members about uh, her goal of requiring that CLS become an organization uh, whose mission would be to address poverty in our advocacy by address, uh, addressing race equity. Um, really making this an organization-wide mandate. And she followed through on that plan, um, first by sending Murph and I to, as, as Murph had mentioned, the, the Shriver Center's Racial Justice Institute in 2015. We were part of a team with uh, two attorneys from Northwest Justice Project that participated in you know, in-person and remote training over the course of several months. And I think it was helpful for us because it, one, you know, provided uh, at least two staff at the organization, the opportunity to put time specifically aside to focus on incorporating race equity into our work. What would that look like? And allowed us to acquire through the trainings, through the sessions, a framework and some tools through which to incorporate this work. So, you know, along with that, um, there were other staff who were demanding this change. And I think primarily staff of color. And um, we began to apply some of that training within the organization. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be brief here because I, I don't want to go over my time. We could talk about this for, you know, three hours. Um, but this included doing some of our own trainings on some of the concepts and, and curriculum uh, that had been developed and learned uh, and eventually developing an organizational plan around equity work and requiring that uh, uh, equity analysis be included in our, in our advocacy uh, acceptance process. At the same time, there was the development of what was called the, eventually called the Race Equity Toolkit uh, for helping us to analyze whether proposed advocacy was actually pushing us in the direction of doing racial justice work and whether or not we needed to adjust the advocacy, whether or not we needed to do additional analysis uh, to ensure this was the case. Um, I think that toolkit uh, has or will be made available to you. Um, and it covers a number of topics to analyze, uh, including 
um, community engagement, data analysis, what systems are at play, how uh, racism is playing out in the um, advocacy that we are uh, looking to take on. Um, and I think as, as we'll probably discuss later, of course, this has been a really uh, challenging process over the last five or six years. And, and I think um, a lot of those challenges, of course, um, uh, were there at the beginning. And while it definitely wasn't um, universal, we experienced serious pushback um, at some point, I think at all levels and, and resistance to this idea uh, because of the discomfort with talking about race and, and being willing to accept change um, um, in the organization. And, and personally, I think there were some challenges around how we were having those discussions. Um, so, for example, I, I talked about how we were doing trainings uh, early on, and I think that those trainings became very technical, really abstract, um, which I think worked for folks who uh, primarily didn't want to talk about race. I think it fit into the, uh, uh, the nature of the legal culture as well. Um, but the academic approach um, really, I think, in some ways wasn't valuing staff of color because um, by taking that academic approach, there was less of a focus on things like actual lived experience. And I think even, you know, uh, fits into the, uh, the theme of this discussion, which is moving from theory to practice. I think a lot of what we were talking about was, was theoretical. We weren't talking about the experiences of folks. Um, and that's not to say that, you know, training and, and development of tools like the toolkit uh, shouldn't, I think, be part of a race equity plan. I think they are valuable, but they can't be the sole method through which, um, you know, an organization like CLS adopts and, and um, uh, effectively does um, race equity work. And this was eventually called out um, as this process played out. Um, you know, I, I think staff were, and, and particularly staff of color who have began to caucus and, um, you know, we worked together, called ourselves the, the collective, um, started talking about that, you know, it's important that there's these changes develop externally, uh, but equal and similar efforts need to go into what's happening internally uh, if, if CLS is truly to be a racially equitable organization. Um, and again, I'm telling the, the really abbreviated version, but um, as a result of these discussions, uh, the collective uh, drafted a letter and it outlined all of the internal problems that CLS related to race uh, and included evidence, um, uh, mostly the personal experience of staff. And we focused on, on four areas. You'll see that um, in the letter, uh, office culture, leadership, professional development opportunities, uh, hiring, and then also problem solving of, uh, of employee concerns. And the collective, which I think was helpful, also provided a, a non-exhaustive list of proposed solutions. And I, I think that was the real turning point at CLS in terms of our race equity work, in terms of it uh, becoming institutionalized. Um, it was direct, uh, it was honest, it was accurate. Um, you know, no punches were held back. And, and, and what was, um, you know, also important is I think that the collective was not just in a problem identifying space, but also was in a problem solving space. And again, I think it was the first step CLS took from uh, moving out of the abstract into reality and, re and, and like it being very proximate um, to everyone in the organization. Um, and, and, and so I really, you know, credit the collective and its members um, and this, I think, goes to what Murph was uh, describing in the in the poem she was uh, talking about. Uh, she read, and th and that is, you know, it takes a lot. It took a lot of courage to describe what was happening at CLS, and not knowing what the result of that would be, um, and 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 to go into a deep, real, a, a real deep internal analysis to call CLS out as um, as being part of the problem. And um, and you know, as a result, I, I think we're we're moving in the direction of being a, a very different organization today than we were um, five or six years ago. Um, and 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 that's not to say that um, you know there's still not uh, issues around race uh, and race equity that arise. But I I don't think that you go into this work uh, and and hopefully this is not the case saying that uh, we're going to solve. Um, uh, racism, that, that's never going to happen. This is always a, 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 a developing and evolving process. People come and go, um, new issues evolve and come about. And so I don't think that's um, uh, anything that we want to be able to just sit and say, we, you know, mission accomplished. 
Um, I, I think the goal has been to say, let's continue to be intentional about this work. Let's make sure that it's part of the mission of the organization and that um, is as much work and as challenging as this has been in the previous five or six years, it's going to be just as challenging as we move forward into the next five or six or 10 years. Um, so, um, you know, I probably have gone over my time here a little bit, but that's a kind of a brief introduction into um, some of the work that uh, that is started at CLS back in um, 2015, 2016, um, that has served as kind of the basis for, um, for where we are today in, um, in our race equity work. Thank you, Nick. That was uh, absolutely perfectly on time. And I think our message too to folks is that if CLS can do it from where we were at to go where we are now and continue to do the work that almost any organization can do this work as well. Once we did and looked internally and started thinking about our culture and what parts, parts of our culture were harmful to folks, we started to look at how can we as we change our culture, how can we look to the community to work with the community? Very quickly, I'll say that I had the experience of a community member saying to me, the work that I was doing was not community led and all in the ways that I was acting that wasn't in or helpful to the community and was actually harmful in some ways. And that was a very difficult experience for me, but also a turning point. And being open to those kinds of experiences, I think is hugely helpful. And now the community folks that had called CLS out are our very close partners. And how did we do the shift? We get asked that a lot. What, who is community? What does it mean? How do you really do that? Who makes the decisions? What does this look like? I've also received several memos and really long worded emails from folks who say that you can't do legal work this way. And I respectfully disagree. So I'm gonna turn it over to our uh, Director of Equity and Community Engagement, Travis Andrews. Travis has an extensive background in doing this type of work and in working with people who are impacted by the criminal punishment system. Uh, Travis was the lead investigator on one of our recent cases for youth in the King County Jail who were being held in solitary confinement, not just for one day or one month or two months, but sometimes longer than six months. That class action is ongoing and almost all of the youth impacted in that case are youth of color. Uh, Travis has led our community engagement work now for more than a year we've made this shift. He's a practitioner of restorative justice and leads that process internally at CLS. The goal is to hold folks accountable and also to heal folks who have been harmed. Travis is currently a student at Seattle University School of Law uh, and hopes to continue his work to reform the criminal justice system. Thank you very much, Travis. Yeah, thanks, Murph. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here. Um, so Nick kind of touched on a, a few key points, uh, and I think um, one is kind of our, our need or our, our, our push to kind of step into uh, the idea of uh, that we may be doing things the wrong way. Um, which, is, which can be a, a very new concept, especially when you have practiced for 30 years in an area uh, and you've done it successfully in terms of wins and losses in the legal system. So I, I wanna kind of touch on uh, just a few things, one being the importance of like hiring on my role, which is the uh, equity director uh, and not leaning on, uh, on our staff to kind of do our equity work part-time. Um, so I think one big key, key that came out of the, uh, the equity letter uh, was kind of this, what do we do when we have concerns around race equity in our organization? How do we manage and handle those types of, uh, those types of issues? And so the idea of the equity director came out of that. And so what that does is it shifts uh, the, the responsibility of Nick and Murph to kind of build out our community engagement and our racial equity pieces uh, and puts it on someone who is hired full time to focus on that work. Oftentimes, uh, legal aid organizations and nonprofits tend to really hone in on the symptoms of racial issues in organizations. Uh, and so as a result of that, we oftentimes get uh, initiatives or kind of part-time um, attention to those types of issues in the organization. 
Uh, and so the bringing on of the, the creation of the equity director at CLS was really uh, stepping into a place of um, investing in our racial equity work in our organization. And that's important because, you know, staff of color really uh, wants and wanted at the time to see CLS really invest um, in that work. Um, and so that the creation of this position really allowed uh, time and space for folks to have someone to check in with around racial equity pieces and to also drive that work. So we'll talk more about that, um, hopefully in the question and answer piece, um, but I really wanted to touch on that um, very quickly. <clears throat> so as we've kind of started to think about community engagement and community lawyering, uh, we really wanted to uh, get some understanding and some grounding uh, in what it is that we're talking about. So there are a few definitions that I'm just gonna uh, read off really quickly uh, that I think will help provide some context. Um, one is community. How do we define community as an organization? Um, we had defined community as those affected by the systems that cause and perpetuate mass incarceration and inequities facing our immigrant population with emphasis of people of color. Um, oftentimes, folks of color are, are at the intersection of these issues, and so it doesn't necessarily require us to call that out, but we call that out because it is a, uh, it's an important piece to this, and as long as we are naming those things, we are calling them out. Um, it's kind of like what we are, what we're framing this whole discussion around, which is how do we turn it from a theory into actual practice? Uh, so naming that creates the ability for us to really start to walk what it is that we're talking about. Um, and then the other definition is a community partner. So community partners are that population of folks that we just defined as community, um, but that includes a collection, I'm sorry, that um, those folks would also have a priority, a prioritization that aligns with CLS. Um, so if we are hoping to empty out prisons in Washington state, our, our partners, community partners would essentially be folks who would have a similar mission or be working towards that same end. Um, and so I really thought it would be important to name those things because those uh, terms may come up quite a bit, especially in the question and answer portion of the discussion. So, <clears throat> excuse me. I, so I will flag that I'm a little under the weather today, so I may, you may hear some coughing and things. <clears throat> excuse me. So, where we are now, so we've put in a lot of work. Um, we have hired on four full-time staff uh, to focus on community engagement to help drive this work internally. As Nick uh, highlighted, we had our uh, race equity toolkit, which at one point in time was like a three hour conversation specifically around race, um, where we really dove into the nuts and bolts around our race equity uh, analysis of any particular project. Um, but we wanted to take it further than that. Uh, how do we take uh, this separate conversation and integrate it into our advocacy more generally speaking? Uh, and so what we've done is really start to create positions and roles in our organization that can help drive our community engagement work. Uh, it's not enough to just say that we are partnering uh, with community. How do we develop long-term and valuable relationships with those folks so that when we are making decisions in our advocacy, when we are choosing how we're gonna move forward in our advocacy, there is a direct linkage and relationship with folks who are impacted by these issues. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and so we've really started to, to think about what it is that we are looking for or hoping to accomplish in, the, in our uh, community engagement. So there are four kind of key principles or key concepts that we really depend on in terms of our community engagement. Uh, and I think this went out to a lot of folks uh, before today. So one of those is vulnerability, <clears throat> willing to be challenged and or relinquish our own comfort when we go into spaces. Accountability, willing to be humble and, uh, and, uh, and have some humility around the work that we're doing. How can we be consistent and willing to be committed uh, and intentional in our work? And then the biggest, I think, is kind of trust. Uh, there's this term that a community organizer kind of came up with, and it is uh, building at the speed of trust. So we can only go so far, we can only do so much um, if there is a lack of trust. Uh, and once you start to build and develop that trust, then we're starting to, to, to really focus in and hone in on something bigger than just uh, our own perspective of the advocacy. 
So historically, in the traditional model, we've had uh, we have prioritized our legal partners uh, and legislators, uh, and then kind of grass tops organizations, um, and then community oftentimes fell at the bottom of our kind of prioritization. Um, and what we've really tried to do in our uh, community engagement work is really shift that. So what our model, we've created a model. Um, and in that model, we've really tried to focus on community partners and our client communities being our prioritization. And that doesn't mean that we don't work with our legal partners or we don't work with legislators. It just means the first place we wanna check in um, is with our community partners. What are these issues that are that that you all are facing uh, in your space around this particular issue? What are some unintended consequences uh, that may come up around this particular issue? So we really wanted to uh, start to hone in on like how we can uh, how we can start to uh, manage manage our relationships and manage how we showed up in our advocacy. So we have a model, and in this model, we have kind of a four tier approach, and within those four tiers. Uh, it's kind of a funnel concept. So first and foremost is kind of our general know your rights. Uh, here's some information about CLS. Um, this is a really broad concept. Uh, it's pretty strict. Uh, I'm sorry, it's pretty uh, aligned with what most folks consider to be outreach. Uh, the concept is to really get our name out there and get folks to understand who we are as an organization and what we offer. The next step is uh, really starting to build in accountable relationships. So once we've kind of established who we are uh, and talked about what it is that we do, how can we start to develop and, um, and uh, build in accountable relationships with the folks we're engaging with? And then the next tier we have is kind of community asks. So out of those relationships, uh, community oftentimes requests things from us. So it could be, hey, can you all look into this particular piece of advocacy, or can you, uh, you know, help us with this particular policy? Uh, and then the final piece is kind of our advocacy, more generally speaking. Um, and within that advocacy, that could mean lawsuits, that could mean uh, a number of different things. So I am kind of right at time. I'm hoping that we can kind of dive into some of these concepts, particularly what we struggle with in our organization and have continue to struggle with. Um, but I'll leave it at that, and, uh, and I will pass it back to Murray. Thank you all. Thanks, Travis. At this time, we are going to take a five minute break uh, as part of being an organization that tries to uh, make room for everyone in all processing styles and particularly the interpreter. Uh, we will take a break. Please feel free during this time to review the materials, contemplate your questions and breathe a little bit and maybe even dance. We will be back on at around 1.35. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. We hope you enjoyed the music and your break, trying to uh, model that, even though sometimes it is challenging not to try to pack in everything we absolutely can. I'm really excited next up to introduce another uh, colleague and another friend, our advocacy director, Janet Chung. Janet joined CLS as the advocacy director in 2017, right when we were uh, in the thick of internal issues and challenges. And Janet has stuck with us and just been amazing. Prior to joining CLS, uh, Janet worked to advance worker rights, expand and protect reproductive health care, and address sexual violence in workplaces and schools. Her legislative advocacy and litigation resulted in expanded insurance for reproductive health needs, protections against discrimination and public accommodations, new equal pay laws, and employment protections for pregnant workers and family caregivers. She's also worked for years to create new labor standards such as paid sick and safe leave and paid family and medical leave and has been amazing in spearheading those efforts. Janet is going to talk about taking the theory and idea of race equity and actually putting it into practice and what that journey has looked like. Janet. Hi, everyone. So happy to be here and to uh, have you all join us today for this conversation. So um, I will just kind of tell a chronology of um, the work that I've been involved with um, since joining CLS. And um, when I started here, um, as you all have heard, um, it really was uh, under a MERS leadership. 
that um, we have uh, dug into this journey on race equity and um, a directive that Murph um, gave to me was to implement the race equity toolkit that Murph and Nick um, Allen had uh, developed and really bring that into the advocacy. So I'll be quite honest that as someone who is still beginning my own race equity journey, you know, I had lived experience as a person of color, a lawyer in um, these systems, um, but I still wasn't exactly sure where to start. Um, it felt um, like a big task, easy to say, let's just incorporate more race equity, right? Um, but what does that really look like? How are we gonna do that in an intentional way? Um, so one thing I noticed right away is that um, we had this wonderful toolkit, um, but people were not necessarily using it and they certainly weren't using it consistently. It was long. It really was more of a curriculum. It is more of a curriculum. I, I think it's a great resource, but um, as to the question of how do we really um, make sure advocates are using it and using it consistently um, was a different matter, right? It was not a checklist. It wasn't intended to be. These are big, tough questions that the toolkit raises. Um, so one, one way to look at it is to talk about our advocacy development and acceptance process, what it looked like, um, what it looks like now, um, and uh, where we still have some work to, to do. Um, again, I'll be honest with you, um, it is a work in process. So at the time um, when I started, we had a, um, what I think is a probably a fairly traditional advocacy acceptance process that asked a lot of good questions. Um, it entailed the advocate um, doing investigation, working up a memo answering a list of questions. Things like, is this a project priority? Will it affect a large number of people? Will it reduce poverty? Are we the right people to be doing this case? Um, are we likely to succeed? Do we have enough resources, right? So these are, again, good questions to be asking. Um, and in fact, they had fairly recently been revised by my predecessors um, in, the, in my position. And then when the race equity toolkit um, was developed, um, again, I think uh, it, to be, again, uh, honest and patent with everyone that, that it was, it was uh, not readily accepted immediately. And I think um, really having new leadership um, pushing this as a priority made, made a big difference. So at the time that I joined, we had that memo with the questions that people had to answer. And then um, a last question was added please describe the race equity analysis or thought process you engaged in as part of your development of this advocacy proposal and summarize the conclusions reached. Use the race equity toolkit to support the analysis. Um, so as Travis mentioned, there were um, some groups, um, some project teams that would um, really set aside time for each proposal to, to work through those questions and really dig into it. Others, um, the memo would say something like, um, you know, well, I've looked at the data, and if we do this advocacy, um, it will um, primarily impact, um, you know, people of color, uh, because, um, you know, the majority, I'll just pull one example, the majority of um, youth uh, who are currently um, in our jails are people of color. Um, you know, it would be, you know, so you see really varying levels of depth of analysis, um, and definitely, um, you know, it was a bit uh, some treated by some as a, a, a check the box exercise. Um, and so uh, just to make things even more fun at the same time um, with uh, the change in leadership, we were ongoing, undergoing um, a major strategic planning process um, that resulted in this big shift that um, others have talked about in the way that um, we thought about the work and what the work was. Um, our priorities shifted so our primary lens was how can we use the tools that we have as lawyers to shift power to those who are most impacted by the systems that keep people living in poverty? Okay, so um, all of this is going on. Um, we're really growing in our thinking and analysis, but um, you know, I guess all that to say, it wasn't going to be a simple fix. I don't think I ever thought it would be, but. Um, there were a lot of different ways in which um, our shift was happening. We had to shift our priorities. We had to shift our, um, our acceptance process and our training, um, and even the way that we work together, how we're structured, um, right? So um, we uh, were looking um, again at um, being recognizing the fact that 
we exist in our state, in our civil legal aid system in a particular way. It's, I know it's different for some of you in other areas of the country, but in Washington state, we were actually, our organization CLS was specifically created to preserve the tools of policy and class action lawsuits that our direct services LSC funded partners were not able to exercise. Okay, so that really fed into a lot of our analysis about what is the work that we are we exist as an organization to do, and how um, then do we layer um, race equity into that analysis to shift what our priorities are? Um, so we focused on who is it that we're trying to impact, um, who are the people that are furthest from power, and what role do we as legal aid lawyers have in perpetuating that system? If you think of legal aid as a system itself, which I have to say was an aha for me. Um, and you look at the way that we're funded and the way it's baked into our federal laws that some people are deserving of legal aid and some people are not. Um, so again, all of that fed into our recognition that we exist so that people who are cut out um, of other legal aid services can be served. And um, we also need to focus to be more effective on um, people who are incarcerated, people who lack US legal status. Um, and ultimately in applying a race equity lens to our theory of change, um, we needed to be listening to the people who are most impacted to do our work more effectively. We did not wanna be um, lawyers on top, but lawyers on tap. Um, I don't know who said that, I, I didn't make it up, but I love that idea that we need to be available to the communities that we serve and not deciding on our strategies in a vacuum. Um, so uh, I'll try to be really brief and just touch on what some of the changes we made um, in order to um, you know, not make it a check the box um, on our advocacy acceptance um, proposal memos. Um, so it, again, started uh, with identifying clear strategic priorities for our organization, as well as for our advocacy. We um, created a new position, advocacy and community engagement specialists. Sorry to our interpreter, I know I'm speaking very quickly. Um, so those positions were not the only ones charged with building relationships with communities, but they shepherd our work. They really lead that work of relationship building and connecting to our client communities. That is so critical if we really are to be following their lead. Um, and we did change our advocacy acceptance process. Um, we, I did not want to be in the position of late in the game after someone has spent hours investigating an issue, putting together this memo, um, saying, and this is where we were a couple of years ago, at that late point um, saying, but have you checked with uh, people who would be impacted? Who have you talked to? Who asked us to do this work, right? And so we really have worked together so that um, those questions are asked early on. Um, that is really the initial question that should be asked. Who's asking us to do this work? Um, and then you get to the legal analysis and all the other kinds of things that go into um, a, a proposal. So overall, I would say that, um, you know, looking back, um, it, it wasn't an easy process. It's still ongoing, but some of our goals are ultimately to have genuine relationships with um, the communities that are not extractive. We are not um, going, we don't want to be in the position of going somewhere and saying, hey, can you be our client, right? That never feels right or comfortable. And um, it's because it shouldn't be. That's not the way um, ideally it should work. We should be listening. We should be listening to what are the priorities that communities are already organizing around. Um, and again, they already know what the solutions are. We really, um, ideally our goal is to be the ones who help um, enable and get communities uh, clients to their solutions rather than being the ones dictating what that work should be and what it should look like. I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Janet. And we have a, a questions. Please put your questions in the in the Q and A. We have a quite a few questions about accountability. I'm going to start with one for Nick Allen. And if all the panelists could now please turn on their cameras so that the audience can see you as we go through the Q and A portion. And we'll do Q and A for about. Uh, 13 minutes, and then we will take another break at two o'clock. So uh, Nick, was there a time in this ongoing process when you felt frustrated or defeated? If so, how did you address it? What changed?
Yeah, um, of course. Um, I uh, that yeah. I, I think to say that everything runs smoothly would be um, yeah, that would be inaccurate. Um, I, I think uh, there were a couple of um, instances that I can think of where, you know, there was the point of feeling frustrated. Um, one was what's been talked about a little bit earlier. And I'll try to give, you know, some concrete examples here. Um, I think there's larger, um, broader issues that cause frustration as, as well um, uh, during the process. But I'll talk about these two. One was um, this uh, discussion that, that Janet has alluded to around the um, advocacy acceptance question. I think this goes to um, they're not necessarily being, that they're being pushback uh, defensiveness um, around this being incorporated into our um, into our advocacy, you know, um, when it was first proposed that uh, we in some way analyze uh, racial justice as part of our um, as part of our advocacy, um, the quick response was, yeah, let's just add this as part of the um, the, the 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 checklist approach. So is it? It's just basically a yes or no answer. Um, no real analysis going into or examining how that plays out. Um, not really uh, approaching this from a, uh, like a case planning approach, but again, more from a checklist approach. And um, I, I think that that was a um, um, cause for frustration. Um, it, it's, it's an easy way to approach the work. It's an easy way to just slap a label on something and say, hey, we're doing race equity work right now because we have a question on our advocacy acceptance criteria. Um, you know, and I, and I think um, uh, it was important, I know, to a lot of the folks at the organization that it go beyond that. And there was a, um, there was a, um, I don't know, a, 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 a battle around that. And I think part of it, I think, was um, of addressing it was just being, <laughs> taking the skills that I think we have as lawyers in a legal organization. Uh, to push this, you know, developing strong arguments for why the case planning approach was necessary and all the work that had gone into um, developing this plan, and to also to listen to the folks who are actually doing the work um, and um, take some direction from the, the plans that they are developing rather than just um, uh, taking your own approach to the work and saying, well, I haven't done the work, but I'm going to implement this um, uh, particular uh, policy or approach. And you know, I think I'll be honest. I think those arguments that that we developed just were, uh, you know, far superior to the checklist approach. I think we had everything, evidence to back up what it is, uh, why we wanted that approach in place. And then um, the other way to address that frustration was just, you know, I think through th there. Yes, there was pushback at the organization, but there's a lot of folks, and um, particularly folks in the collective that you know were demanding that this um that this approach be put in place so it was about reaching out to colleagues having these discussions kind of building um coalition and relationship internally within the organization with other staff um which i think ultimately um proved successful to get us to more again into that analysis space um then into um uh, the, the, what we had been doing in the past and just answering yes or no. Um, and then just quickly, I think another, uh, point of frustration, at least with the, um, uh, external advocacy was, and, and I can't remember the details around this. I'm trying to remember them off the top of my head, but, you know, um, a really detailed and I think, um, helpful and well-planned out memo was put together, um, early on to say, this is how we should be doing the work. Um, this is where we're getting this, um, uh, th this is the basis for this work, um, that we need to be a more uh, community-centered organization. Uh, here's the goals and here's how we're going to accomplish those goals. And it was the first time in presenting that, it's like, you know, you think sometimes, you know, something is well put together and um, well thought out that there's not going to be any, um, um, uh, disagreement with that. And there really, there was pushback. And I think at one point, I want to say 
uh, Murph and I and others had to go back and, you know, redo this, this memo three or four times. And I would say unnecessarily so. I would say for the purpose of building frustration, for the purpose of stalling and delaying. Um, and it really wasn't helpful in moving our, um, our organization forward um, towards this goal. I will say that it helped us to dig in our heels a lot more and to say, yeah, we've got a larger fight on our hands here than we may have um, initially thought. Uh, but in terms of the substantive work and, 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 and moving that forward, it, it was frustrating and, and uh, thought that there might be a quick demise to um, uh, this work being incorporated in the, into, a, into CLS. But, but like I said, I, I think it was also um, eye-opening. This is going to happen, I think, within any organization, uh, regardless of if there are you know, strong support in some corners from um, a lot of the um, uh, organization. So hopefully I didn't go on too long with that and that was helpful. No, thank you, Nick. There are quite a few questions about white fragility, conflict, accountability, and I think you answered uh, many of those questions. Uh, this question uh, next up is for Janet. Can you give a specific example or examples of litigation that was focused on race equity or had race equity outcomes as its goal? Yes, I have a couple, but I'll focus on two that are uh, quite different. So um, one um, is our uh, fairly recent um, case that went to the Washington Supreme Court challenging the exclusion um, of agricultural workers from um, having the right to overtime pay. And um, I will say just to kind of give the history of this case, it did coincide with a lot of these changes that were happening. So I can't say that, you know, our change in um, program is what <laughs> made the difference there, but I think it's a good example of um, the way this um, thinking about the work systemically um, can really change the way a case looks. So it started out as a, um, it was on behalf of um, dairy workers um, who had um, suffered a variety of um, wage violations, um, including not being paid over time, but the easy answer to that issue was that uh, they were not entitled to it under the law. So um, the way I like to um, describe how I, I think a regular lawyer would um, generally approach something like that is, well, I've looked at the statute and you're not included, I'm sorry, there's no case. Um, but what that team did was go beyond that. We did represent them um, as a class on the claims that they, that, that they did have under the existing law, but they went back and said, you know, this is not an acceptable answer to say uh, the law doesn't include you all, sorry, but really to dig into why is that? And that um, embarked, uh, the, the team then embarked on an exploration of the history of the Fair Labor Standards Act, of the adoption of um, essentially the same law in our state. Um, and uh, all of this information went into the case, the history of um, you know the New Deal uh, Democrats um, making this deal basically um, to keep the the race peace in um, in the South, and um, that was the the deal that was struck. And so, bringing all of that information, and then finding, of course, the legal theory that would support that, and the opening, which was in our state constitution, um, in uh, the Privileges and Immunities Clause, which is our version of the Equal Protection Clause, but different enough that there was room to argue. Um, which we did successfully, that it should be interpreted differently. And um, any time that the, essentially there is a um, group that is excluded or granted privileges under a, a law, um, and that there's not a reasonable ground for that, that that is a basis for challenging it. And so um, that is a way that um, I, don't, I don't know that they set out thinking this is going to be our race equity case. Um, but the result was um, to really, it was a challenge to um, again, the, the, the law that reflected, that had racism baked into it. So I consider that um, a race equity um, case and a race equity win. Um, a completely different case that I do want to mention is our work um, that is ongoing in helping um, fruit packing uh, workers organize. And so the legal work for that looks like we are supporting them in challenges in getting their collective bargaining unit um, recognized by the employer. So that is an area uh, new to our team is traditional labor law. Those are, that's the kind of law that it is. But um, the end result of that is to 
try again to shift the power um, so that we don't need to be there. If they ha have a union that is recognized, um, they can fight their fights, they can negotiate with management. It doesn't have to be done in the context of a lawsuit. Um, the other piece I'll mention to that work that can be hidden is just the work of um, helping them to be recognized, not just legally as a union, but to um, organize um, and file all the necessary papers with the state as a um, business entity, right? Um, so sometimes that work of just supporting a community organization, um, it is legal work. It's not um, what oftentimes we think of as legal work because it's not litigation, but um, that's just another way in which we have been working to support that, um, that uh, nascent union. Thanks, Janet. We have about two minutes before our break, and I will give one question before the break to uh, Travis, and there seems to be several people interested in this question. How is the director of equity position informed by and accountable to staff who are most impacted by the policies and practices developed to dismantle harmful organizational cultural norms? Yeah, this is a really great question. Um, <clears throat> so the equity director role, so as a part of our organization, I'm also a member of our equity team. Uh, and our, I'm sorry, not our equity team, our the collective. And the collective is uh, the caucus group for folks of color in our organization. Uh, and so I go to those meetings, I hear the input from folks, I hear what they're experiencing, I hear um, you know, what things are working, what things are not. I can weigh in and say, hey, I'm experiencing these things, this is what's working and what's not. Um, here's how you know, these policies impact me. I think the position itself is informed by that because it, it was created at the request of uh, the collective letter. So as a part of that piece, as a part of the collective letter, this position was kind of developed. It started out as an internal person who, uh, who moved into that role. Uh, and then we kind of, once that person transitioned out, I transitioned into that role. Um, but the equity director role is really built to uh, hold our organization to a space uh, accountable to what it is that we say. Um, so I think my role comes in a lot in, um, in developing our policies or developing our practices internally. There's a lens that goes on all of that. Uh, and while that's not my specific role, we are at a point now where it's not just Travis, it's not just the folks who focus on equity, um, but we've tried to institutionalize that throughout our entire organization. And so Janet can, can weigh in on policies or Nick can weigh in on policies, uh, but I am here as a checkpoint uh, for Janet if she wants to check in or for Nick if he wants to check in. Um, so I, I want to keep us true to our break, um, but it's informed by it because it was created out of the request from the collective um, and those policies and procedures. Uh, I am a part of that process, even if I'm not the decision maker or the person putting that decision on that. Um, I am a checkpoint as a part of that. Thank you, Travis. We are at two o'clock. And again, we are going to take another break to process all the information, think about the questions that have been asked and have a break for the interpreter and for everyone that may need it. So we will see everyone back at 205. See you then. Thank you. Everyone, we're back. Sorry about that. I lost track of the time I was trying to get through all the questions in the chat. So we will start again. We have about 20 minutes uh, for Q&A from the audience. Could I would ask that the panelists please put their cameras back on so that everyone can see you. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the break. The first question is for Travis, and I would also ask Janet and Nick to weigh in from the advocacy side as well. We've had several questions on the topic of community accountability, particularly with uh, Black, Indigenous, and communities of color. Uh, part of the question is, how are we accountable in those relationships? And generally, legal services organizations has, has focused on professional organizations, so tenants unions or places where there are paid staff and not smaller organizations of Black, Indigenous, or communities of color. And if we do decide to take on and represent one community and provide them legal resources, then there are other communities that we are deciding not to give 
legal resources to and are not receiving our support in that way. So this question is for all of the panelists and I'll start with you, Travis. This is a really good question. Uh, and I will start by saying we have not figured it out yet. Um, I just wanna flag that we are still processing and, and, and learning how to do this. But our approach to accountability looks like showing up without an agenda and being able to hear what those issues are in those spaces without coming in with something already designated uh, that we wanna focus on. So that's one way of kind of starting that, starting that relationship. Um, but as we are there, as we're in community space and as we're in relationship with folks, uh, it's really just uh, how can we create a transparent uh, exchange of information? Um, so if we are working on, you know, uh, a policy around a particular issue, um, how do we how do we communicate that? How do we talk about how we landed on working on this issue? How do we talk about all of those things and how do we communicate that back to our partners? Um, so we, we try not to take on anything that has not come from a partner or that is not informed at least by a partner. Uh, and so the idea is that every piece of advocacy that we take on in some way is accountable to uh, those partners that we, are, that we are in relationship with. Now, in terms of, uh, it sounds like a prioritization, I, I think, question. Um, the way that we think about our partners, is it in a vacuum? So we don't think about, you know, uh, you know, our, our black community over here and our indigenous community over here, it's more thought of in a network. Uh, and so if we are partnering with, um, you know, the black prisoners caucus and the prisons here in Washington state, um, then we're also partnering with the Hispanic cultural group uh, and the prisons. And we're also partnering with the native uh, groups in, in that space as well. And so the idea is that there are individual pieces that each uh, group may, uh, may have based off of their identity, but collectively, I think a lot of the issues are overlapping. Uh, and so it's very rare that you'll find a specific issue uh, that affects one group that doesn't have an, a, a similar impact on another group. Um, and so we really try to think about this in a network rather than uh, kind of silo uh, partnerships. Uh, and so, as we think about that network, how do we make that network? How do we get those partners to function together for a broader, more systemic push uh, on, on the issues that we focus on? So that's kind of what I think our approach is in terms of how we prioritize. It, it very rarely requires us to pick a group over another. Um, and so, yeah, that's just, that's just my, my take on it. Nick or Janet, do you have anything to add? Um, trying to think about how to articulate this best. I, I think there's a couple of things that go into um, developing accountability. One is uh, been touched on already. Like this stuff takes um, time and consideration. And so you, I think, have to be able to have the time and space to um, be able to have resources to go into community and be able to do that, number one. And I think that, um, again, I, I agree with uh, Travis, we haven't figured this out yet, but I think the, um, the, the we're moving in the right direction with that. And that is to have uh, resources put in place within the organization to ensure that we can do that analysis and that we can go into community and that we can um, hold ourselves accountable um, and, and be uh, genuine and authentic to that. Um, the second thing is like, um, how do we know if we're holding ourselves accountable? I mean, the communities that we work with are not shy about letting us know if we have not been accountable. It's just like any other relationship. If you're not, uh, if you're saying something time after time after time, and you're not um, um, delivering on that um, on that promise, um, it's going to quickly be known that we're not going to mess with you anymore. You don't do what you say. And I think that's really easy to fall into that trap, provided you don't have the resources to do it. Um, and to take the time to think through how are we going to ensure that, um, like the question thrown out there, that we're not, you know, over or disproportionately um, um, working with one group over another, that we really are being 
um, uh, open and um, have the have the time and space to be able to connect with um, as many groups as is as, as possible and many folks in the community as possible. And then I think the third part of this is, um, and you know, this doesn't apply to every um, uh, uh, staff member for sure, um, but um, you know. Uh, a lot of this, I, I think breaking down the divide between community and lawyer is one of those things. A lot of us are part of the communities that we're working on behalf of. And um, so, yeah, sometimes we're walking into a room with our lawyer hat on, but we always got our community hat on as well. And, um, uh, you know, <laughs> that's part of the uh, accountability piece um, uh, that, that factors into this too. And I think having uh, advocates, having uh, lawyers, having staff that are members of the community um, um, uh, lessens the chance that there's that difference, that there's that othering that takes place, that like I'm just here as a lawyer um, and so I can afford to be unaccountable because that's the only place and spaces that these folks are going to um, see me in. And so I, th I think that's, um, again, it's not perfect, but I think those are three ways to get at the question of, um, of uh, accountability um, within community. I just want to add a couple of things if I could. Uh, one is that, uh, yes, I actually see it as a sign of success if we get called out or in by, um, by a client group or community partner, and um, it is not easy and it's the same as with you know other types of feedback um a colleague of ours has said feedback is a gift which it definitely does not always feel like but um i do think that is you know true if you can take the space to appreciate it as that um one two separate really uh, distinct points one i just wanted to mention that we do have um of course a role in our civil legal aid universe and recognize um and have tried to leave space for um, partner asks, right? If we, um, in particular policy, um, there are areas where there is no other group that can carry that water um, with the legislature um, because of funding. And so there are areas where we um, have tried to um, be good partners and use the expertise, the subject matter expertise, even if we don't have that, um, and use our lobbying capacity in, in that way. Um, and I've forgotten the other points, so I'll stop there. <laughs> Can I, can I just say one more piece here? So I saw in the question, in the uh, question and answer, there was a piece about uh, how do you measure progress year to year? Um, this is always an interesting topic to me because uh, I learned in a really interesting way, like how to measure things outside of kind of your wins and losses in court. So Nick Allen and I have this experience. I share it often. Uh, so we went to a community uh, meeting and uh, this community meeting, we were there with really bad news. Yeah, we had filed uh, something that we did not win. It wasn't looking good. We're in this space. There's probably 60 people in maybe 100 square feet or less. And um, in the middle of this meeting, we have lawyers, we have legislator was there, community folks, and they broke out in song and dance in the middle of the meeting, despite this bad news. Um, and I'm like, I don't, I really don't get it. I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, and they were celebrating the small win, like the fact that they organized and that there were folks that they weren't connected to before that endeavor started, that they were now connected to, that was progress for them. That was success. And so we really had to start looking at and thinking about what that looks like for us as an organization as well. And while we still value wins in court, um, that's not the only thing we value anymore. And progress sometimes looks like just connecting with new folks. Thanks, Travis. That it's it's beautiful because it it is about I think the way that you put it always and that I remember is that it's relational, not transactional. And I used to always think it was getting the client to sign the retainer agreement and moving forward. And it was that was the relationship, but that's not it. That's transactional. The next question is a lot about pushback and accountability. There are several questions in this area. And the gist of the questions to summarize them are who did we receive pushback from organizationally, like other programs, funders, our board, and what did that look like and how do we do with it? And then I'll go into the next question, which is about accountability. Is there someone who would like to jump in on that about pushback? Janet? 
I would, I'll start. I would say the answer is, did we receive pushback from any of those? The answer is yes, all. <laughs> um, and kind of to tie it to the last question actually is because I'm thinking about accountability. And I think a big um, piece um, that has been really important is um, to, as you said, focus on the relationships and that being transparent about where we can do work, where we're no longer doing work, um, where we're trying to uh, do work, but you know, don't have uh, resources right now. All of, being able to communicate that honestly um, it has been really important. I think it really pushes against what many folks working in legal services, um, you know, we tend to take it all on and it's really hard to say no and you feel terrible and like you're not doing your job if you aren't taking every case, every needy person and that's not realistic and we burn out that way. So I think um, one uh, challenge has been to um, communicate that to staff. We're still working on that, right? Uh, and let them feel okay, permission um, to say no, but to communicate that and, and the why when possible. So similarly, I guess um, kind of lumping together the funders and um, some of the, the board is the idea that when you say no, you are saying no to one thing, but you're freeing up your space to be more targeted and hopefully more effective. You're not as diffuse. I mean, there are times when uh, you all probably can relate. You, I feel like the chicken with my head cut off and you're just like scattershot. And um, I think everyone understands the, the idea that, okay, if you can focus um, more effectively, that may mean saying no to some things, but um, it is really being able to say yes and in a more effective way. So I think that is how we tried to communicate with partners. Um, I will not lie that it is you know not always gone over well. It has been hard. Um, there's been a lot of learning. Um, I think that we, we have been really lucky in Washington to have partners um, in general in civil legal aid also starting on uh, the race equity journey and um, developing some self-awareness. So um, but that has it's been a process, and but I think that has helped us be able to get where we are and deal with some of the pushback. And we did have some uh, pushback uh, from our board. Some folks turned over as we made some of these changes and really focused our work in specific ways. Our funders were very supportive for the most part. Uh, We've been in conversation with them over the long haul and have had support. Uh, I think there was pushback uh, when we were doing work to stop a new youth jail from being built. And I gave a one minute, less than a minute speech. And the one line that the Seattle Times picked up was that I said that, that youth jails and jails in general were part of slavery and part of the slavery system. And I received, I can't say how many emails and calls from leaders, professionals, lawyers. Our board even received calls from judges about that statement. And that was probably three or four years ago. So we do receive pushback and we have to do it anyway. We have to be willing to risk everything to do this work. I'm gonna, Travis, go ahead. Yes, turn it over to Travis. Sorry, Mark. no, I was just going to say, as a part of that pushback, what we've been able to do along the way is like find ways of connecting with folks, educating folks on why Murph's statement made sense, why Murph would make that statement. You know, how do we bring folks along the way rather than just leaving it at pushback? Um, so I just wanted to add that in, Murph. <clears throat> yeah, those pushbacks become incredible learning moments and points of connection, and they really have been for us. A couple of questions have come up and we have a few more minutes to answer is about internal accountability. What are still some of the problems that CLS gets called out on and how are we addressing those kinds of conflicts, including restorative justice? Uh, where, where, are, where are we struggling still? Do you wanna start and then Travis? I saw Travis was going to talk, and I'm assuming to get into some of the restorative justice stuff. So I'll, I'll let Travis go first here. Okay, go ahead, Travis. Yeah, I I think some of the I think where we have some of the biggest issues internally is hierarchy. Uh, I think we are still unpacking what that means and how that fits into the broader narrative of the work that we do. So 
Most folks in our organization have all worked in some sort of traditional structure. Uh, and we are trying to do something different than that, uh, which is difficult. It's not easy. Uh, and so as we kind of unpack that, I think what we get called out most on internally is kind of the hierarchical, who gets to, who gets to turn down work, who accepts work, you know, who, um, yeah, I, th I think those are the pieces that we struggle with uh, the most. Uh, in terms of our restorative just our restorative practices, I'll say, um, so our restorative practices are more geared towards folks who have like interpersonal pieces. Um, and, and that's the way that it's been used mostly internally. Uh, and so what we've done is just create a process that allows folks uh, to come either to myself or other folks in our organization to weigh in, I'm sorry, to get coaching on difficult conversations or to actually have a restorative discussion with someone that they may not necessarily feel comfortable having those conversations with. So if Murph is the person that folks have issue with, Murph's the executive director. So there are power dynamics that exist there that may make it uncomfortable for me to have that conversation with Murph. And so restorative, our restorative practices are essentially to create um, coaching opportunities to have conversations with Murph in that example, or for a facilitated dialogue to happen uh, with the person in Murph. Um, that's kind of essentially what we use them for. Uh, they don't get used a whole lot, um, only because once we get so far in the process, folks resolve their issues before we finish um, and, uh, and it ends uh, quicker than anticipated. So I'll leave it at that and then uh, turn it over to Nick. <clears throat> yeah, I believe the question is, what are we still struggling with? And um, I think that the question, the answer to that is we're still struggling with everything that um, has been raised, particularly in the collective letter. I don't, like I mentioned earlier, I don't think that we're ever um, at a place, nor should our goal be uh, mission accomplished on uh, racial justice. That is, that's, that's not going to, that's not going to happen. And the minute you say that, um, the minute um, you're going to start regressing as an organization, you're going to start to see old patterns start um, arising. Instead, uh, with each of these issues, the more we get towards um, um, uh, looking at one issue from a particular context, new issues are going to arise. Our goal is really to have the, um, the tools and the structure in place as an organization to be able to address those struggles on an ongoing basis. I think that's why a lot of folks don't wanna get involved in this work because the reality is, is there's never going to be a time when you can just close the book. It's, we're talking about uh, race and racism here. That's not something that you can um, address in a three to five year um, you know, timeline. It's just, it's, it's, it's way bigger than that, as we all know on this call. And so I would say we continue to struggle with all the things that were pointed out in the collective letter. We continue to struggle externally with, um, you know, how to best advocate on behalf of our communities. Um, but uh, while there is a, a challenge in having that struggle in place, I think it's also a barometer of that, that we're probably um, also, um, uh, doing some of the right things because uh, once we say, hey, everything is good, then I would be really fearful of our organization um, um, that we've taken the easy way out and that this was, you know, uh, really uh, um, uh, lip service. Um, I, I want to be uh, struggling with what um, we're dealing with. I think that's the only way that we're going to, um, uh, to progress and evolve as an organization and in our relationships with uh, internally and with community. So it's always hard to go after <laughs> Nick and Travis, but I just want to add that um, I, and recognize that I think part of the struggle also is just managing in that shift. And you're always going to have, you know, people coming and going and kind of trying to bring them up to speed on the conversations past. But um, in particular, as we're seeing, um, I think, a shift in um, newer attorneys uh, of color, particularly joining um, uh, and in learning different ways of doing the work, um, we uh, have also, it's been hard to kind of hold and support 
people who have been here a long time doing things a certain way, understanding their role as lawyers in a certain way, um, right? Everything from the urgency with which we respond to um, to legal issues, um, to the way we think we need to appear in court. All of those things are, you know, part of their training. And to still be able to um, support and convey the value that every person brings to this organization, um, that is really tough. Not everyone is, um, frankly, willing to do that work. There are a lot of people who are like, you know, on bo both ends, either, you know, uh, someone who's been here a long time saying, I just want to do the work. I don't want to uh, spend all you know all this time in meetings talking about race equity, right? Um, and I've also heard on the other end of the spectrum, people, um, younger attorneys of color, saying, you know, um, if this is just going to be a place like everywhere else, um, let's not pretend. I can just go work at a law firm, and um, I know how I'm going to be treated. And I, that's I'll just put my head down and do my work. And obviously, I don't want either of those things to happen. But just want to recognize like what people need is different, and that. All of that is resources and time and emotional energy. Um, so be prepared for that if um, you are embarking on this journey. And I think it's worth it. And we're never done. Never done. I love that, Janet. That's a great way to close. We're close to time. I want to thank our panelists for all of their answers and for sharing their journeys and being vulnerable with us. And we have a way and a tradition of closing meetings at CLS that I will also ask everyone in the chat to participate. And I'll go through each panelist uh, out loud. So we ask everyone to put one word in the chat about how you're feeling or where you're at. Please put that in the chat and I'll start with Travis. One word, please. Oh, energized. <clears throat> Nick. Uh, I'm good. Janet. Reflective. I want to thank everyone for attending. We will be following up with uh, email with all of the resource and resources links so that everyone has them as well as a recording of this session. I particularly want to thank Vanny Cadero, our interpreter. I want to thank Adriana, Annabelle, Noemi, Kia, and Shelly all for their support because uh, without everyone doing the work, we couldn't have had this panel. So please feel free to reach out to me, to reach out to the panelists if you have more questions. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of the questions. I'm excited seeing all of the uh, responses in the chat. So thank you everyone for listening and for being on this journey with us. We really uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much.